everyone, Diana Draker here, and we finally have that educational plus anima special I was talking about. It's based on an essay I wrote in university that was about plus anima. I liked it so much, I wanted to share it. So, I hope you enjoy! The relationship between humans, nature, and animals is an interesting one because even though many humans believe themselves to be superior to other animals, it has been stated that humans must succumb to nature. However, just because the human race in general may feel superior to animals does not mean that animals lack a sense of humanity. In fact, Natsumi Mukai's plus anima can be argued as being a critique for this matter as well as questioning which is more human. the human species or the rest of the world's animals. At this point, it may be obvious that there may be a definitional challenge in assessing what elements constitute humanity. For the purposes of this paper, the concept of humanity includes agency, social connections, wonder, and curiosity. In the context of these elements, this paper will address the relationship that humans have with other animals. First, I need to provide a quick summary for a plus anima. In Mukai's world, there is a phenomenon where if a child of age 14 or younger finds himself or herself in a life or death situation and there is an animal nearby, then that child may borrow the animal's anima, gaining the natural abilities of the animal and allowing him or her to live. When a child becomes a plus anima, a mark is left on the body where the anima entered and the marking also tells the world what type of plus anima the child possesses. Despite the circumstances required to become a plus anima, these plus anima children are often shunned from the rest of humanity, being seen as monsters that need to be destroyed or controlled. In this tale, four particular children from Austria are traveling together to find a place. Somewhere where we can live and eat and sleep! There aren't many places plus anima kids can feel at home. These children are Kuro, a 12-year-old crow plus anima who was raised in a church, Husky, a 12-year-old fish plus anima who is often mistaken for a girl, Senri, a 16-year-old bear plus anima who is quite listless, and Nana, a 12-year-old bat plus anima who is ironically afraid of the dark. Because the plus anima in Mukai's world have an animal's anima inside of them, they are naturally closer to nature than humans are and thereby serve as beings living in between both worlds. This relationship is stated by the leader of the First Nations clan who appears in the story. The Kimunku respect the power of nature, the power of plants and animals. A plus anima is the power the earth gives us to live. Mukai herself does not actually have much background information that has been released to the public. In her author notes within the Plus Anima volumes, she reveals that she enjoys drawing children and food, and that she has a corgi named Futa, whom she refers to as the official healer. With this in mind, I personally find it interesting that her personal website is called Corgi Beam. She does, however, reveal the difficulty she had in writing Kuro because of the secret background that she had planned for him, but his happy-go-lucky personality sometimes resulted in him writing himself. She has written two other manga, Wander Wandering and Nui. These two series suggest where her interests and knowledge lie. The former of these manga was written before Plus Anma and is about a round-eared child named Wander who causes trouble for long-eared people. Nui, on the other hand, is a story about a teen girl named Kaya who believes in her plush toys so much that they actually come to life and can occasionally take human form. In Nui, the main cast of plushies, purple, gray, aqua, and pink, are almost identical in personality to the main cast of Plus Anima. They reflect the dynamics of a stereotypical shonen hero, a good-hearted but hot-headed boy, the strong silent type, and a stereotypical girly girl. This consistency suggests that this is Mukai's favorite relationship dynamic to write about and or what she excels at. I believe she must have some knowledge about video games, if only the Fortune Quest games, because she provided the art for all the manga adaptations. Otherwise, there is no available information on her personal background or education. However, it has been suggested that it is safe to assume that Mukai has been educated in a way that resulted in the themes of the Plus Anima series such as the idea of nature and humanism. One may look at the actor network theory as an example of how some of the public responded to the idea of the inclusion of animals and humans as a part of the same social network. First to clarify, the actor network theory is a critical analysis theory about an action network. 
where anything that moves can be an actor and included in the same network as others. The controversy stems from this idea. Socialists and some philosophers believe that rather than the inclusion of all living matter, one should only stick to a few, specifically the human ones. However, the actor network theory needs the subject to have his or her own agency in order to produce action and is more than willing to allow animals into that category. This later admission is the primary reason why this controversy exists. Believing that something that is not human has its own agency, possessing an awareness and consciousness of its own, can be an unsettling thought for some. It has been discussed that this controversy may arise from a fear of replacement. This particular fear is brought up in Plus Anima by the character Kazuna. In Sailand, or Silent, depending on the translation, slavery of Plus Anima is a common occurrence. In fact, Plus Anima are not considered part of the social hierarchy and must become a slave at any cost if they wish to survive in Sailand. Kazuna is a hawk Plus Anima and in charge of a rebellion group known as Wish, trying to get equal rights for Plus Anima. Plus Anima, have confidence in yourselves. Our abilities make us better than ordinary humans. Why not create a world where we can use those powers for ourselves? Think! Think why we became Plus Anima in the first place! That's right. Plus Anima are dangerous. I can fly and I have sharp claws. I could easily tear someone to pieces. Kazuna's rallying speech at the slave market auction brings to mind this fear, as in theory, the more powerful Plus Anima could replace the humans in society if they actually tried. Thus, the reason for the need to control the Plus Anima. This may also be the reason why hundreds of innocent Plus Anima were slaughtered by the Austrian army during the War of Moss Mountain 20 years prior to the start of Kuro and his friend's journey. While on the topic of the war that happened 20 years prior, this matter actually made life harder for Plus Anima. As if it wasn't bad enough that hundreds of Plus Anima were killed during the war. In that war, Salen was using their Plus Anima slaves as part of their military base. Due to this use, humans on the Austrian side of the war were sometimes killed by Plus Anima, which in turn made the prejudice and fear towards Plus Anima worsen. Furthermore, one can view the plus anima of Salen as a type of commodity. Just as an example, a coyote plus anima named Daisy is not only treated like a lap dog, but has also started acting like one. Although in Austria, slavery is illegal and plus anima are more feared than in Salen, there are some who have their own plus anima commodities. Husky is introduced to the raider when he is being sold to an Austrian circus and states how wrong it is to treat plus anima as slaves and commodities. In real life as well, humans trade animals as commodities to be one's companion or to slaughter as food. While the latter is more of a survival need, the former may stem from a human desire to be in control. Just for example, the ability to control such a large and powerful creature like a horse stems from such a desire. Some scientists theorize that horses may fulfill a power fantasy for young girls. This concept of control and power over nature and animals has been brought into question even when regarding endangered species. Sarah Rimfret argues that the want to save wild animals may not fully stem from a want to reintroduce them to the wild, but rather to introduce them to a wilderness that better suits human needs. By this she argues how entire species have been forced into a human watch habitat where they can reproduce and become wild. However, that entire species was trained how to fend for themselves because of human intervention. Thus implying that due to human intervention, humans are able to control the natural selection process. In other words, control nature itself. The character Fly, who is arguably the main villain of the Plus Anima series, does have the ability to create Plus Anima in a similar vein to how humans can control natural selection. As I mentioned before, for someone to become a Plus Anima, they have to experience a life or death situation. However, one can also lose their Plus Anima because if the Anima feels as though it is no longer needed, it will return to the animal that it was borrowed from. Fly is able to use a surgical method he created himself to simulate both situations. Fly is able to surgically remove an Anima from a Plus Anima and should a Plus Anima have their Anima removed willingly, then the animal will also survive the separation operation. At that point, Fly can transfer the Anima into someone of his choosing. 
Hence, Fly has the power to control all the plus anima in Austria if he wants to by transferring all the country's anima into people who are loyal to him, showing an extreme example related to Rinfret's work. Though to be fair, he denies these charges, but that doesn't change the fact that it's possible. A fear of replacement may not also be the only fear that compels humans to make animals the other. There also may be a fear of becoming no better than an animal or other. Psychologists like Sigmund Freud try to explain and justify this act. Freud attempted to secure a place for the animal as other, which is to say as a property of the unconscious or non-rational dimension of being. This othering is also present not only in plus anima, but also the Japanese Buddhist hierarchy. In at least one form of Japanese Buddhism, there are six realms. From top to bottom, these are heaven, Ashura, or Titans, human, animal, hungry ghosts, and hell. If one were to be reborn in the animal realm, then not only would they be lower on the karmic totem pole, but they would also have to endure several tortures, almost equal to the tortures one would be put through in hell. A fear of becoming the animal, or a plus anima, is also a fear that many new plus anima children experience. What, him? Oh, he just became a plus anima. I heard he's a porcupine. Is he locked up because he's dangerous? Or is it because he's being punished? No, he went into that cage on his own. What? Apparently, he feels like he's dangerous and needs to be locked up or something. Some kids are like that when they become plus anima. I was the same way. When I became a plus anima, I didn't know what to do. Although it is natural to think that this fear comes from the treatment of plus anima as the quote shows, I believe that part of this fear stems from a fear of turning into a true primal animal. In the three chapters of plus anima that Mukai wrote for the serialization meeting, which would eventually become the plus anima we all know and love, and are compiled in volume two of the series, something of this nature actually happens. A town sheriff who is secretly a crocodile plus anima eats the humans who commit crimes in his town. Despite the fact that none of the chapters submitted to the serialization meeting are considered canon, Husky does recall an event where a plus anima ate a human before his eyes, meaning that there are plus anima who lose their humanity upon becoming the animal. Gerald L. Burns states that becoming human is predicted upon the evacuation of the heterogeneous, which means the negation of nature. Hence, the opposite must be true. If one were to become human by controlling nature, then one would become like the animal by succumbing to nature. In a discussion of the play Demon Pond, an idea was stated that all humans must eventually succumb to nature. By that logic, eventually everyone on the planet would become an animal. If that is humanity's fate, then one final fear that creates the tension and distance in the human treatment of animals and nature could be a fear of this fate and a fear of death. One could very well argue that plus anima are a representation of death because of how one becomes a plus anima. Furthermore, the main protagonist, Kuro, is often mistaken as a messenger of death throughout the entire series because of his black wings. As a child, Fly met a girl who had turned into a pigeon plus anima after she tried to commit suicide. Fly, in an effort to gain the ability of flight, tried to duplicate her feet by also committing suicide, but was foiled by the girl in his attempt. Also, there were no birds around? So, yeah, that wouldn't have ended well. And the cliff wasn't too high up anyways. The idea here is that through death, one becomes closer to nature and thus is able to become a plus anima. This idea that humans become closer to nature through death is true in real life too. As at someone's funeral, they return to being part of one of the four natural elements as per Greek elements. For example, when one is buried, they return to being the earth. Or when one is sent off to sea, they return to being one with the water. This idea is also present in Japanese Buddhism, where it is upon death that a person could enter the animal realm. Death trauma, or post-traumatic stress disorder, may be related to the idea of how one must experience a life or death situation to become a plus anima. PTSD is a mental disorder that may develop after exposure to exceptionally threatening or horrifying events. 
One of the criteria for PTSD is the reliving of an extreme traumatic event. As a plus anima, the children do not only constantly remember the traumatic event, but also have their plus anima as a semi-permanent scar from the event. As such, one may argue that the result of becoming a plus anima is a parallel and fictional reinterpretation of PTSD. The fact that the children's tragedies haunt their memories and continue to torture them physically via the public views on plus anima make it difficult for the children to overcome and move past their depression and anxiety. For many patients, PTSD is severe and enduring, but recent studies have shown that group therapy is effective for the healing process of PTSD, and Kuro gathers a group of plus anima. As they travel, the children, especially Husky and Nana, learn to accept and embrace their plus anima rather than run from them. In most places in the world, death is not treated as being pleasant. This is most likely due to cultural religions where certain animals or animal-like creatures are associated with death. Hence, there may be a religious aspect when looking at the relationship between humans and animals. The plus animal manga itself has many Christian references in it, possibly due to its setting in medieval Austria. The most obvious of these references is that Kuro himself was raised in a church by nuns. The sisters and the teachers were all so nice, and even though I had at black wings, they said it was okay. They said that white angels are messengers from God in heaven, and black angels are the messengers of death, but we need both. Although the nuns from the church where Kuro grew up were not only kind to him, but also showed favoritism to him, the rest of the world did not see him in a good light. In the two-part chapter, The Angel Lake, a swan plus anima takes advantage of the people's religion-based superstitions to become a real angel. By doing so, he is able to get free things from the people in the form of offerings and feel like he actually exists. When Kuro and Nana, who both have black wings, try to convince Saranova the swan plus anima to leave town, Saranova convinces everyone that Kuro is the true messenger of death in an attempt to force the main characters out of town instead. Superstition, especially religion-based superstition, can play a role in how humans approach animals. It can be said that becoming animal is an affair of sorcery because it implies an initial relation of alliance with a demon. Staying on the topic of a crow for now, in Japan, the automatopoeia of a crow is shi shi shi, which makes it sound like it's laughing the word for death over and over. A similar notion is most prevalent in the West as the black wings of a crow and dates back to ancient Greece's Nyx. Nyx is a personification of the the knight who is sometimes depicted with black wings. She is mother to several children who would come to be related to death, such as Nemesis, Karen the Boat Rider, and Thanatos, the personification of death itself. This has also been seen in Christianity with the death angels, both good and bad messengers of death. Perhaps this in part pertains to the general negative view towards the animal. In Japan, crows can grow large enough that they hunt mice as part of their diet. Furthermore, this size makes them more dangerous than the crows found in North America, as in both cases the crows are not afraid of humans and the former can get quite aggressive towards a human should one walk into their territory. Despite this association, in Japanese mythology the crow is depicted in a more positive light. The crow is the most common tengu that one comes across. Tengu are a group of mythological creatures found in Japanese traditional lore and religions that are similar in some ways to goblins in the Western tradition. These Tengu are designed to protect the Buddhist law, though still act as tricksters and troublemakers to those whom they dislike. Furthermore, the mythological Shinto Yatagarasu is a three-legged crow creature who represents the heaven's intervention of human actions. Actually, when Kuro was traveling alone, in a way he acted like a Yatagodasu for a character named Rem and his younger sister Franny. In the chapter, Rem is trying to make a statue for the town mayor so that he could afford the medicine that he needs to help Franny combat the illness that made her blind. However, the statue that he has been contracted to make is an angel, and because he has never seen one, he is not able to make the art piece properly. Thanks to Kuro's intervention, acting as a makeshift angel, Rem is able to complete the statue and buy the medicine for his sister. This event also makes Rem question the superstitious stereotypes brought about by religion. I wonder who decided that angel wings are white. On a wooden statue like this, they could be any color. As heartwarming as 
that scene is, Kuro is not the only one who is subjected to prejudice due to religious views towards his black wings. Another plus anima, Mr. Bison, who is a bison plus anima, is also subjected to this treatment. However, Mr. Bison's treatment is arguably more closely related to the animal realm in Japanese Buddhism rather than the Christian view that the rest of the plus anima characters are subjected to. R. Keller Kimbrough's findings on the Kumano Mandela show that upon death, humans who have tortured animals will be reborn as animals to be tortured by the demonic versions of the animals that they had once abused. However, he goes further to explain that in the animal realm, one can find demons that appear to be different animals that were spliced together. When Kuro and his friends tried to go to a hot spring inn for a bath, they found one that was completely abandoned because a demon or monster was sighted going into the hot spring. Even though the owners of the hot spring inn knew it was actually a plus anima, they were talking about hiring a professional to exterminate the creature. If Kuro and his friends had not found and warned Mr. Bison in time, then the latter could have really joined the world of demons. Though the event with Mr. Bison is one of the more extreme cases, one can argue that the majority of the normal humans in Plus Anima view the Plus Anima as either demons from the animal realm or heavenly deities. In fact, Fly believes that the Plus Anima are closer to the divine than ordinary humans because of their powers. He believes this to such an extent that it is revealed in the series' final arc that he is trying to make a real angel by using the anima he takes from Plus Anima children. She's an artificial life form, and she's an angel. A mediator between God and man, the realization of mankind's ancient dream of flight. But she was not complete, so Aaron and I implanted all sorts of anima into her. We put makeup on her so the anima markings won't stand out. If angels are closer to God than man is, then they ought to have all the abilities found on Earth, right? Taking religion to an extreme, Fly is able to play God and create an angel of his own. The huge twist at the end of the series is that Kuro, the main protagonist, was in line with Fly the entire time. His original reason for traveling with Husky, Nana, and Senri was so that he could give Fly their anima. When the three refused to give up their anima, Fly took Kuro's anima instead, though he was planning to do that from the very beginning. However, instead of transplanting it into Blanca like he had done with so many others, Fly has it transplanted into himself, becoming a new angel of death. Ironically, after getting the black wings, Fly really does die while flying with those wings, as if his actions beckoned him to hell. As clearly shown by Mukai's plus anima, religion has some impact on the relationship humans have with some animals in nature. In fact, the question may arise whether animals, or plus anima, are more human because they are closer to nature. Or is the human race more human because they have overcome and taken nearly complete control of nature? In the discussion on Demon Pond, it was stated that humans must always succumb to nature in the end. For example, in the play's ending, the demon of the pond, Princess Yuki, brings a great flood, wiping out the town. It was discussed that perhaps to be human, one must be at the mercy of nature, no matter how much control one thinks one has over nature. However, as other animals are considered to be inherently a part of nature, they thus cannot be overcome by it. Then there are plus anima, the beings who were created to critique such a matter. They are naturally closer to nature due to their anima. So does this make them less human? If not, then what does this say about real animals as nature? I believe the next thing to discuss should be the idea of the anima itself. An anima is a term describing something that all living beings supposedly possess. The anima is meant to be in tangent with the animus. In folklore, the anima is supposed to represent one's light, and the animus is one's darkness. Furthermore, an animus is the very spirit of the being, whereas the anima is the soul. Hence, when a child pulls in an anima, then she or he is gaining a second soul in a stronger light. By this logic, the plus anima husky witness eating a human most likely drew in an animus instead of an anima, thus gaining a second spirit in a stronger darkness, meaning a more accurate term would probably be plus animus. The anima and animus, the soul and spirit, make up a being's heart. Ironically, whereas the anima longs for a home with family and friends, such as Kuro and his friends long for a home, the animus is associated with an earthly nature. By this, it is assumed that the animus is the more animal part of the being and the anima is the more human part. By this logic, it means that all living beings have a human nature in them. Keeping this in mind, it is logical to conclude that plus anima are more human than the everyday human because they have two animas, the one they were born with and the one that they acquired. 
There are also some who have used the idea of the anima and animus to address gender studies. In these studies, the anima is more associated with femininity and the animus is more associated with masculinity. As the animus is the more wild part of one's heart, this idea most likely comes from the stereotypes of the male and female. The qualities of the anima and animus can be seen more easily as stereotypes rather than archetypes of masculine and feminine behavior. Interestingly, in plus anima, the plus anima who ate a human before for young husky was male, as was the sheriff in the cut chapters. However, the anima and animus cannot be the only elements that make up one's humanity. One of the most prevailing arguments that I have come across is curiosity and imagination. People have been wondering what stuff is made of since the beginning of time. Antelopes, by contrast? Haven't. Unfortunately, this point is not one that can be argued about by only using plus anima, because the plus anima were originally average humans. However, plus anima does lead to a point that can be used to argue whether animals have curiosity and imagination. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a trope used in storytelling since long ago, when animism was the dominant religion. In these stories, it was quite common for there to be animals to transform into humans and either guide or trick them. Due to the importance of these stories from the past, it is likely that metamorphosis has continued to have a presence in literature as a way of initiating a nostalgic notion from the ancient tales. Animals define themselves in terms of their magical abilities. Animals in such tales often remind the humans of the spiritual power they have over them. Furthermore, animals with the power of metamorphosis have been argued as a way for authors to explore psychology in a safe place, such as having a dangerous human murderer in reality be a carnivorous animal. Hence, the audience doesn't need to worry about a dangerous human being amongst them. When one activates their plus anima ability, she or he goes through a metamorphosis, such as growing wings, having legs merge together to form a fishtail, or having nails grow abnormally sharp and or longer. Looking at the reverse of a plus anima, an animal that can transform into a human does propose a way to look at the issue of humanity in nature. Looking in Japan for transformation, one can find in ancient folktale stories, primarily in the form of transforming kitsune foxes and tanuki. Foxes and wolves may all attain an age of 800 years, and when more than 500 years old, they are able to metamorphosize themselves into being shaped like men. Though these tales are fictional in nature, it is important to know that they are believed to be true by some people. One of these tales about the Kitsune foxes regards a lord who lived during the time of Emperor Kime. This lord had obtained a beautiful wife. On the same day that their son was born, the lord's dog also gave birth. The puppy grew up to hate the wife, and eventually she was forced to flee and revert back to her true form, a kitsune fox. It is most interesting that just as plus anima have a sign that shows they are a plus anima, regardless of what form they are via the marking, the kitsune fox also shows signs that they are really a fox regardless of their form. However perfect the transformation seems to be, there are physical traits that are left behind. For example, the shadow cast by the transformed kitsune fox remains in the shape of a fox. And if the kitsune fox is inexperienced, then it may accidentally leave its tail exposed while transformed as a human. Furthermore, one can distinguish a disguised kitsune fox by its behavioral traits, such as the incompatibility that a fox has with dogs. More interesting than the transformation stories about the tanuki is scientific evidence for the current rapid evolution of the tanuki in real life resulting in transformation. The tanuki is even radically shape-shifting its genome, thereby distancing itself from the four subspecies of raccoon dog. In fact, the tanuki itself is transformed into two subspecies. Hence, one could say that the tanuki as a species is trying to differentiate itself as neither a dog nor a raccoon by transforming itself into its own species. In the transformation stories depicting the kitsune foxes and tanuki, although often portrayed as tricksters, they always show they have their own agency in humanity. The tanuki possess agency, complex emotions, and independent will, much as would human characters. It's also been discussed how these transforming animals are sometimes normally stronger than their human counterparts. One example comes from the play Lady Kuzanoha, where, when the true Lady Kuzanoha appears, she seems to be more cynical and uncaring than the fox Kuzanoha that the audience would have grown to love. In another tale, a lord finds that there are two versions of his wife in his house. Deciding to torture one of them, the lord finds out that one of the women is actually a fox playing a prank. Afterwards, the Lord decides to exterminate the imposter.
But when he goes to kill the fox, several other foxes in the pack show up to appeal to the Lord's humanity in order to protect the fox who wronged him. Being moved by the pack's words, the Lord decides to spare the fox. In Plasanma, there are some similar incidents. The first example that comes to mind is when Kuro, Husky, and Senri first meet Nana. The boys first track down Nana because they believe she had stolen Husky's pearls. Nana told the group that she was falsely accused and that she had not in fact stolen the pearls. Husky's character would normally distrust Nana for the simple reason that she is a girl. This character trait is so strong that in a later chapter, Husky tries to leave the group when Nana is invited to join. Yet upon meeting her for the first time, he is swayed by the fact that she is a plus anima and despite his natural inclination, he initially believes her story. In fact, her story was a lie. Nevertheless, Nana was able to convince the misogynist Husky into believing the words of a female. However, this is not exactly the same as appealing to the humanity within a human from an animal's point of view, because this example comes from a plus anima appealing to another plus anima who has shared similar circumstances to become that plus anima in the first place. A more concrete example from plus anima comes from the two-part chapter Wings of the Wind. When Kiro follows what he thinks is a fellow bird plus anima, he winds up crashing with a glider, an invention of the character Shadow. Thinking that his glider failed again landing on top of Kuro, Shadow takes the boy in to tend to his wounds, and the two become fast friends because of their mutual love for flying, despite the fact that Shadow has never flown himself. Nevertheless, when Shadow learns that Kuro is a plus animal with wings, he sends him away. Kuro. Yes, Shadow? You're making fun of me, aren't you? You had wings this whole time. You must think it's hilarious that I'm struggling with these fake ones. How could you ever understand how pathetic I feel? Just go away! Flap those wings of yours away from here! However, Kuro returns and risks his life to help Shadow deliver medicine to his younger sisters living atop of a mountain. From that selfless act, Shadow realizes that he was wrong to send Kuro away and understands that Kuro's plus anima form does not mean that he lacks a just human nature. When looking at the overall picture of humanity and nature, these stories of metamorphosis and transforming animals display how human an animal can become. The animals display human emotions such as love and compassion and even human exclusive curiosity. Furthermore, there is evidence of real animals sharing these traits. Considering imagination first, it seems fair to say that in order to build tools and come to some sort of alternative solution, one must be capable of imagining that solution. Although perhaps other animals are not as curious as humans can be, there is a sense of wonder an animal can find. It is because of this curiosity that young animals may run off to explore their surroundings on their own. An unexpected example is that a bonobo learned how to play Pac-Man. That's a thing! Love and compassion are also seen in animals, such as when a courageous pack of puppies went off to explore their surroundings and one ended up being left behind. The supposed leader of the pack went back for it when it started to whimper. The concept of humanity includes agency, social connections, wonder, and curiosity. From what I have explored, the conclusion that can be drawn is that to be human is not a physiological makeup of the being, but a psychological makeup of one. The main inspiration for this paper was the idea that humans must succumb to nature, as spoken of in the discussion of Demon's Pond. Both in Mukai's Plus Anima and in real life, humans are overcoming nature and playing God. Humans take control of the lives of those close to nature, whether it is taking control of the natural selection process or Fly's surgical process to choose who will be a Plus Anima and who will not. The human's will for power is a driving force in controlling nature. However, part of that will for power may May come from fear. Specifically, this is a fear of replacement, thus leading to not only the mistreatment of nature, but also of Mukai's plus anima children. Out of all the animals roaming the earth, the human race certainly isn't the strongest. However, humans are arguably the most intelligent of Earth's creatures. Nevertheless, the dominant human race is replaceable. This point is also made in Plus Anima by the group known as Wish, led by Kazuna. Although Plus Anima are part human, they are more importantly part animal and have a closer relation with nature as a result. Such a replacement of the human race is threatened when Kazuna not only tries to get the Plus Anima of Sailand to revolt, but also nearly succeeds when he attempts to kill Sailand's king. There is also a fear of becoming an animal. 
This fear can stem from different sources. When looking at plus anima, the primary factor of fear of becoming a plus anima most likely stems from the mistreatment plus anima get universally. The plus anima may also fear themselves, not only because of the public views, but also because the scar of a plus anima is similar to real life PTSD. The source of this fear can also come from a religious background. In the world of plus anima, Christian religious views provide a prejudice for certain plus anima, such as Kuro being treated as a villain for having black wings. However, characters like Rem question if assumptions like these should serve as a judge of character. In reality, religion can play a part in how one views animals in nature as well. Different religions dictate differing views of a specific animal or grouping of animals. The crow, for example, represents bad omens in most Western religions, but contains more positive aspects in Japanese religions. Though still mischievous, crows could be protecting a Buddhist shrine or be a divine guide for a Shinto devout. The story of Plus Anima revolves heavily around the idea of metamorphosis. However, humans transforming into animals has some negative connotations attached to it, such as the idea that it means one is surrendering one's humanity. Given the way Kuro and the other Plus Anima in the series are treated, it certainly would seem as though the majority view them this way. Furthermore, in at least one sect of Japanese Buddhism, it is thought that when one is sent to the animal realm and transformed into an animal, that the animals that the person misused in their past life are turned into demons to torture that person. However, in traditional Japanese folklore, there are heartwarming stories of animals transforming into humans. The two most dominant ones are the stories revolving around the kitsune foxes and tanuki. When the animals transform, all they accomplish is taking on the human form, and their personality would naturally stay the same. Thus, the animals disguised as humans who perform such loving acts must have loving hearts while still an animal, as well as a sense of humanity. At the end of Plus Anima, when Kuro loses his anima, Natsumi Mukai ends the volume with this message from herself. For the time being, Kuro and the others have finished their journey. Kuro has become human at last, and now his new journey as a human will begin. What I would like to note is that she put the word human in quotation marks. I believe that the quotation marks were used because Kuro was already human, despite the fact that he had an anima. He already had his own agency, people that he cared about, and a sense of wonder and curiosity. Even though normal humans shunned Kuro and his friends, the boy's personality was able to charm just about everyone he met. Shadow is just one of the characters that Kuro taught to be a plus anima sympathizer. Taking into account how every living creature has both an anima and an animus, as well as the collection of the plus anima narrative, the conclusion that I can draw is that animals, in equal measure to humans, most certainly have their own humanity, as defined by agency, social connections, wonder, and curiosity. Since humans are animals too, one can see how other animals can have just as much humanity as any other species, just like the world plus anima depicts. If you're interested, all the citations for the resources I used are in the description box below. Well, that's it for me! Hope you have a great day, everyone!